I'm Joel Griffiths, professor of microbiology and molecular biology at Brigham Young University. I'm not feeling well today, so I'm sequestered away in my home, wondering whether I've been hit with COVID-19. The only way to be sure would be to get a test. We've been hearing a lot about testing for this coronavirus in recent weeks, and you may be wondering how it works. There are many kinds of virus circulating among humans, but the coronavirus we're concerned about, the one responsible for the COVID-19 outbreak, is called SARS-CoV-2. The test starts with a swab being introduced to the back of the patient's nasal cavity. This sample contains all sorts of stuff, mucus, human cells, bacteria, and possibly SARS-CoV-2. If present, the viruses would be like tiny needles in a giant haystack. The trick for detection requires a little background in virology and molecular biology. The SARS-CoV-2 virus is a tiny sphere with spikes on it, which you've seen many depictions of in the news. But at a fundamental level, what you see in those pictures is not really the virus. The true virus is inside that packaging material. Inside is a molecular thread of ribonucleic acid, also known as RNA. This is the virus's genome. RNA is very similar to DNA, which is a long polymer of chemicals called nucleotides. While DNA consists of A's, T's, G's, and C's, RNA has U's in place of T's, otherwise it's pretty much the same stuff. The SARS-CoV-2 RNA is 29,903 nucleotides long. Here we're showing you just a tenth of its genome. These are the instructions used by the virus to take over our cells and make copies of itself. This sequence makes the virus unique and detectable. So if you're trying to detect an RNA virus like this coronavirus, you need to isolate the RNA from the patient's sample. This isn't hard, but what you end up with is RNA from the whole sample, which includes human cells, bacterial cells, and maybe virus particles. So just getting RNA out of the sample tells you very little, but it's an important step in the test. After RNA isolation, the next step is to figure out if any of the RNA there, and it would be just a small amount, is SARS-CoV-2 RNA. This is where the test gets interesting, and where you need to retrieve some old memories from biology class about nucleic acid chemistry, which applies to both DNA and RNA. You'll recall that normal DNA exists as a double-stranded thread, with each strand bound to the other through molecular shape complementarity. This concept of nucleotide pairing, or base pairing, is of key importance in biology, and of key importance in this test. A pairs with T, C pairs with G. Now just one A and one T don't make a very strong pair, neither does just one C with one G. But if you have a longer string of nucleotides, then a second string with complementary sequence would couple with it quite strongly and with high specificity. It is this nucleotide pairing specificity that makes the coronavirus test work. Let's go back now to our SARS-CoV-2 sequence. To detect it, we need to chemically synthesize strings of DNA that can pair with the virus genome through these base pairing rules. The good thing is, these strings of synthetic DNA don't need to be very long. Just 20 nucleotides or so is enough to get a good lock on the virus. And they're fairly cheap to manufacture. Okay, back to our test tube. We've isolated RNA from the swab sample, and we want to know if any of it is coronavirus RNA. We now add many copies of the synthetic DNA that's complementary to a small section of the coronavirus genome. If those DNA molecules, which we call DNA probes, bind to the coronavirus RNA, we won't immediately know it. We've got to get these microscopic probes to tell us what they found. Something or nothing. They need to send us a signal that we can see, like a flash of light. To do this, we actually use two DNA probes corresponding to two nearby parts of the viral genome. Along with these probes, we add two crucial enzymes, reverse transcriptase and DNA polymerase. These enzymes cause the probes to change from small snippets of DNA to long and highly abundant double-stranded DNA fibers. The enzymes make this happen, but it only happens if the original DNA probe had successfully bound to coronavirus RNA. If the DNA probes did not find any coronavirus RNA, then no amplified DNA fibers would form. Finally, we add a fluorescent chemical that detects the formation of these DNA fibers produced during the test. If they were produced, the sample lights up and the result is positive. 
If the DNA fibers did not accumulate, then the sample does not light up and the result is negative. Many have worked to improve the speed of the test and remove the potential effects of human error. This is where diagnostics companies have taken the lead in creating advanced devices that allow a clinician to simply insert a patient's sample into a small barcoded cartridge, insert that cartridge into a machine, and let automation take care of the rest, giving a conclusive result in less than an hour. The test I just described only works for a patient who is actively infected with SARS-CoV-2. The next most urgent test to develop is one that can indicate whether a healthy person has previously been infected with SARS-CoV-2 and presumably now has immunity to it. The benefits of such a test are huge, but it would be a completely different test, and one that we'll have to cover in another video, maybe when I get feeling better. <laughs>